Hi, I'm Mike Bird, lecturer in theology at Ridley College, and in this video I have the pleasure of interviewing my colleague and boss, Dr. Brian Rosner, on the theme of personal identity. Now, Brian is a Pauline scholar. He's written a brilliant commentary on 1 Corinthians along with Roy Champer. He's done a number of books on Pauline theology, biblical theology in general, and also ethics. But in more recent years, he's taken to writing on the topic of personal identity. And he does that obviously out of his own experience, you know, the own struggles and events he's been through in the course of his life, but also try to speak into our own age where the concept of identity is very disputed, very debated, and even something fragmented. And there's a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety about this. So I think you're going to really love this interview with Brian talking about his various books like Known by God and of course this one as well. So uh, listen up and uh, watch out and I think you'll really enjoy what Brian has to say on this topic and I certainly had some fun interactions with him talking about human identity. So I hope you enjoy it. Yep, yeah, well Brian, it's great to be with you uh, to talk about the subject of human identity and particularly what it means for a Christian identity and the concept of being known by God. Now, you've written a bit on this. I know you've definitely spoken about it at chapel and your chapel talks as always are stimulating and enriching and people are always leaning and longing for more at all of your chapel talks. Uh, but how did, how did you first get into this topic of you know, personal identity, what it means to kind of know God or be known by God. Where did this first begin for you as, as a kind of journey? Well, it's, I mean, the subject of personal identity is clearly a very personal one. So it is it is an academic interest for me, but it's a much more intensely personal interest, especially in the first instance. So back in the mid to late 90s, I had a kind of crisis of identity myself. And... Uh, being a believer, I, I, I turned back to the Bible to find some help. Uh, I think there was a real risk at that point of me coming off the rails, uh, if you like. And uh, what I discovered was um, the, the great ambition of life to know God was, was a great challenge. It kind of drove me on and kept me going. But being known by God was the thing that steadied the ship. It gave me great comfort and assurance, gave me direction for living and it, it's, it's a neglected theme in the Bible, but it's at critical points. So the main characters in the Bible story, if you like, are known by God. Uh, Jesus talks about not knowing those. Um, uh, I never knew you is what he says to those that are at the last judgment. Paul, Paul actually says it's more important. So in Galatians 4, he says that uh, at one time you didn't know God. Now you do know God or rather you're known by God. But I think the first thing to say is when, when we're not talking about omniscience, it's not that God knows everyone every at all times and everything about us. That, that's a, an important truth. But what we're talking about is personal knowledge. So we're known intimately and personally in the same way that a parent knows their child. So it's got more of a relational knowing rather than a factual knowing because, you know, God knows all human beings who ever are and were, but he knows them in a more relationship sense. Yeah, yeah, and, and some, some languages distinguish that. So in German, you would you have a different verbs for knowing something and knowing someone. Yeah. Uh, in Greek and Hebrew, you don't. Yeah. Uh, but non nonetheless, it's, it's a really significant thing. It's related to other ideas and notions, concepts too. So God knowing your name, your name being written in the book of life. Uh, there's an intriguing stone in the book of Revelation. Uh, God gives you a name that only he and you know. So there's this intensely personal an intimate knowing that we're talking about. Would the modern equivalent to that be, I feel seen? You know, when people say that, I feel seen. I feel like people see my my trauma, my story. Uh, I'm not invisible. I'm not just in the background. I'm not in the dark. I feel seen. Would, would that be, is this like the theological equivalent of saying, God sees me? Oh, yes, I think that's exactly right. One of the Psalms says that uh, God knows the wicked from afar, but he knows uh, the righteous up close. And that idea of, um, you mentioned the, the notion of trauma and wanting to be known and seen. Um, uh, Nahum 1 verse 8 puts it really well, that uh, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. 
it's often translated he cares for, he protects, mm. but that, that, that kind of sense that um, I'm, um, I'm not alone, someone knows my, uh, the struggles I'm going through uh, can be of great comfort, I think. And, and that's one of the purposes of the doctrine in the Bible, it seems. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Now, you started off, I think, many years ago writing an article in Tyndall Bulletin, where I think you went through, what, Galatians 4, kind of, um, you know, about the uh, that verse you quoted from Galatians about, you know, pagans are now known by God. Um, and th then it sort of mulled away for many years, and you came out with a, a biblical theology of, of, of identity. Uh, so what, what was that book about, Brian, the, the, the human identity theology, the biblical theology of human identity? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned earlier, the, the notion of God's um, intimate personal knowing of those of us in Christ uh, was something that I investigated for a Tyndale Biblical Theology lecture those years ago, which was published in the Tyndale Bulletin, and it sort of morphed and developed into a, a book in the Biblical Theology for Life Zondervan series, which is entitled Known by God, A Biblical Theology of Personal Identity. The book's quite a bit broader than simply that idea. So I also deal with belonging to God, being chosen by God, being in Christ. But I do think being known by God is at the center of um, those notions. It's intimately related to several of them. Um, yeah, so that it, it's a, a techie book trying to work out um, um, the, the typical identity markers of race, gender, age, ethnicity, occupation what, what does the bible do with those identity markers um and uh it, it judges in my view it judges them all to be important but not all important if you want to put it that way there's something else that's more important to our identity as human beings and as individuals and groups yeah, well i found it very helpful when i revised my evangelical theology i thought the 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 doctrine of humanity was very weak and I found uh, I needed to have a section on human identity because I think identity, you know, what is it? What is mine? Um, how do I get one and can I have more? Those are the sort of questions that people are having today uh, where you've got all these sort of discrete identities and, you know, and various gender identities. And uh, I mean, my intuition is that identity has become a mixture of personality and sexual preference. And because there's you know, upteen number of um, personalities and preferences, you can get a multiplicity of all these identities. But but it's even it's even beyond that. Uh, but your most recent book is um, How to Find Yourself, Why Looking Inward is Not the Answer. And I don't know if people can see this uh, on the screen on the blur. Uh, but this is more of a popular level treatment of the, some of the stuff you've been saying for years. Um, I've, I've got a number. Of, I've got a number of quotes here, which I think sum up our cultural moment. And uh, you can tell me agree or disagree. <laughs> um, only you know who you are. Uh, disagree. Okay. Uh, in terms of a system of ethics, be true to yourself. Uh, well, yes and no. It kind of depends. Okay. Uh, here's one. This is something of an tautology, but tell me if you agree. I am what I am. <laughs> Well, I'm not a philosopher nor the son of a philosopher, so I'm going to pass on that one. Can I phone a friend? I could yeah, I mean, well, it's a tautology. You, you, well, of course you are what you are. You're, you're not what you are not. Okay. Um, well, you knew the answer before you asked it. That's not fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's from a musical called, um, uh, uh, called La Cage or Foal, uh, and then it says, I am what I am, and then it says, how about this one? How about the next line in the song? I am my own special creation. Ah, well, that, that's getting to the heart of the matter, really. I think because, that... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that the self-made self is really what's happening today with identity. Um, Carl Truman's traced the roots of what mm. we call expressive individualism, the idea that you look within to find yourself, you then celebrate that identity and live in accordance with it, be true to yourself. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's quite um, unique in the history of ideas. So most cultures around the world have what's called a porous self, you find yourself by moving out into society, uh, taking responsibilities for your family, your occupation, your community. And that's well, the yes. journey. That's the journey. You go, you go to the American frontier to go and find yourself. <laughs> but but that, that's the poorer self, I think, is, is more accurate to the biblical cultures and biblical revelation. Whereas now we've got what's called a buffered self, where you just look inward exclusively to find yourself. And, and there are all sorts of people saying this, you need to be yourself, 
No one can tell you who you are. Uh, it's kind of a self-made self. Um, it, so self-determination used to be a principle at the end of the First World War. Now, now it's a kind of everyone's creed. Yeah. Yeah, I will be the captain of my own soul kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah I think sexual ethics is at the pointy end of it. But, but my book's not explicitly or even directly about sexual ethics. It, it's looking at the broader movement, which I think is having an impact on people's lives and society. And much of the impact is negative. The, I mean, there are obvious benefits. Self-exploration is a good thing. Um, giving people who are marginalised, their identity markers for whatever reason are marginalised, proper respect is a good thing. And living in accordance with your identity, authenticity is also a good thing, but it's certainly not the whole story. Yeah. Well, let me give you one final quote, and this is from a famous Canadian philosopher. I'm assuming it's either Charles Taylor or uh, Jordan Peterson. But if there's another one, tell me who said this quote. We are so many things all the time, and I know it can be overwhelming figuring out who to be. And I have some good news for you. It's totally up to you. I also have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you. What Canadian intellectual stated that while receiving an honorary doctorate? Well, um, that's Taylor Swift, as it turns out. Quite I'm sorry, Brian. I said I said Canadian intellectual, and you've referred to Taylor Swift. Uh, I know you we like know her. Mu I know you like her music. I did not know that you're Make also pretty good. <laughs> that you're also a, a fan of her um, philosophical uh, musings. Well, I, I think it really it, it shows the first problem with the movement, namely that looking inward to find yourself, having total responsibility for a self-made self, inventing yourself, puts enormous pressure on you. So you end up with quite a fragile sense of self. And you see that everywhere in society. There's more anxiety, there, there's, there's more crisis of identity. So there's this terrible irony with expressive individualism. It's never been more important to know who you are, but it's also never been more difficult yeah, and but it ha things have changed. Like once upon a time, your identity was purely inherited. You got it from your nationality. You got it from your parents. You got it from their vocation, from your class, um, the city you were from. I know the soccer team you followed. You kind of, you know, we you, which university your family goes to, or something like that. It was kind of inherited. But with with endless choice of who you can be, comes then endless anxiety. It does, it does seem like that, doesn't it? One, one anthropologist said that um, um, traditional societies are like rivers, as you've just e explained. You kind of you know basically where you're going, you're carried along. Um, whereas post, the postmodern world is like an ocean. You can just go any direction you like, any wind of change. Uh, the problem, of course, is you might drown as well. But, but I think the, the thing to say is not just that it's not working very well, because I think it's also leading to not just anxiety, but it seems seems to be leading to a kind of outrage culture, a lack of resilience. Well, it's an, it's an anti-realism. It's anti-realism that reality is purely constructed. There is nothing empirical, nothing bodily about who I am. As in, my body has nothing to do with who I am. And I think the danger is that identity can be a secular version of the soul, maybe like an executive self. But when you have identities that are, have nothing to do with my body or even against my body, I mean, this is going in a this is going into a, a metaphysical or spiritual direction that I that I find being championed by post religious people. But it's it's a post religious way of being religious. This is what I find so baffling about it. Well, it it, it certainly is an ideology, and it carries with it a kind of narrative identity. But you, you've gone all philosophical again on me. So let me back up to the social sciences. It's not just me and biblical scholars and theologians who are saying you don't just look inward. So it, we're, we're three things is what I argue in the book. We're social beings, homo sociologicus, if you like. We find ourselves in relationship by being known by others beyond ourselves. We're also narrative beings. We're storytelling beings. So what unites me as a baby to me as an old man, I'm not quite there yet, um, is, is my story. <laughs> and uh, finally, this is the more controversial one, we're adoring beings. So we're uh, homo adorans. So we look beyond ourselves. And some have argued that you can't have a stable sense of self without transcendence. So that's what I kind of argue in the book. And the third direction, looking up, if you like, not just around, backwards and forwards to your story, but up, is the key to a stable, satisfying sense of self. The gospel teaches us 
as we talked earlier, that we're known by God, that, that social self is ultimately grounded in the personal knowledge of God, and that we're also a narrative self, a storytelling self. But the trick here is we key into shared stories. This is true for everyone again. We don't have individual stories. We, we key into the stories of our nations, our class, our ethnicities. And ultimately, for a believer, what we do is we inhabit the life story of Jesus Christ, which sounds bizarre, but it's at the heart of Christian faith. At baptism, we, we, we confirm this. The Lord's Supper is all about this notion of uh, looking back to the death of Christ, not just as his death, but our death death to sin, and then rising to our, um, uh, with him to be um, uh, shown as God's true children of God uh, on the last day. And I think that makes all the difference. So one example would be uh, Colossians 3, 3 and 4. Uh, and I'll translate it my own way, which, which principles are allowed to do. So uh, you died and your identity is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life story, is revealed, you will be revealed with him in glory. And I think that that really has, in a nutshell, the Christian message about having a new identity in Christ, which, by the way, as Paul goes on to say in Colossians 3, has all sorts of practical impacts for how we live now. It doesn't just give us a hope for the future, but it gives us a, um, a lifestyle in the present. And the Christian life then is all about, as the passage says, putting on the new identity, putting on the new man, as it's sometimes translated, which is really redeemed corporate humanity in Christ. So putting on that identity, which is a gift, and then living in accordance with it becomes uh, being true to your, your new self. So I, I'm all in favour of being true to yourself. Be true to your new self. Yeah, which is what this is the basis of Pauline ethics in many places in, in Galatians, Colossians and Ephesians. The first half is, is that, you know, you, Christ has died and risen, and in your identity, your story is bound up with his. Absolutely. And evangelicals have missed some of this because we, we tend to emphasize Christ's death as a substitution, but, but Christ also died as our representative. They're, they're not um, conflicting ideas. I mean, you read, I mean, for example, Romans 3 seems to be more Christ dying for us, but Romans 6 is us dying with Christ. Christ dies, we die with Christ. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense of that, you know, we can have various identities. You can be a Scottish soccer playing kind of um, physiotherapist, mother, kind of, you know, Pinterest devotee. But those things are all true of you. But your meta identity is that you are in Christ. And I think an in Christ is able to hold within the diversities because we have kind of like a meta identity that brings us together uh, as opposed to the endless fragmentation and options that we, we find around us. Yeah, I think exactly right. So, so basically the Christian teaching, the gospel teaching about our, our new identity in Christ doesn't kind of flatten us all to a uniformity. I'm still a father and a friend and a worker, but it changes the kind of father and friend and worker I am. But the particularities of my life are still important. What happens in my life is obviously important. But the really important thing happened before I was born. So the defining moment of my life is the death and resurrection of Christ. Bonhoeffer says this in Letters and Papers from Prison. It's beautiful. He mm. says, the most important thing about my life story is not that I will die. It's that Christ died. And he, he also has this idea of being known by God as central to his existence. Got this beautiful poem, Who Am I? Mm. It, it's yes. quite famous. Yeah. And it ends with the lines, Who am I? Lonely questions mock me. Who I really am, you know me, I am yours. Just, just an amazing uh, moment and, and so poignant. And, and for people who struggle for all sorts of reasons and all of us face things that are beyond our uh, control and beyond our resources in life, that's what, that, that's what can bring great comfort. That we're still part of the story of God. We're still part of the life story of Christ. I don't have to be the star in my own show which really the genre of my story alone is going to be a, a farce or a tragedy. Uh, the better option is to take a bit part in the grand story of the redemption of the world. And it frees you from selfish ambition, or at least it gives you resources to resist that. All of us are still um, prone to that, uh, you and me um, included. 
Perhaps some more than others. But some more than others. <laughs> but it can make an, an enormous difference to how we live in the present. Mm. And uh, it, it's just a better way to find yourself. Okay, good. Well, Brian, who, who do you think is going to benefit the most from this book? What's well, in the first instance, me. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so look, it, I, I wrote the book because I find the whole identity stuff in our day confusing and confronting. So it was me trying to work out what on earth is happening, what's the alternative to it, what's a better way to live. Yep. Um, and I've written it, at, at, at a, as you pointed out earlier, at a much lower level than scholars, students, ministers. It's a more popular level. It remains to be seen whether it's popular. Um, but in the end, actually, I, it, it's written for non-believers as well. I, I think it is the kind of book you could give a non-believer, someone who doesn't go to church, has no... A special interest in God. The first third of the book, for example, barely mentions the Bible. It's kind of cultural analysis, sociology, what is a human being? How is this expressive individualism playing out in our society? And um, I, I, I hope it's the kind of book you could give to a friend, um, uh, to, especially to later high school, people in their 20s, perhaps, Mm. Um, who are really stuck in this movement. They hear this message everywhere, as you pointed out. I mean, Taylor Swift's words are just one of a dozen celebrities I could quote um, who, who said similar things. Well, yeah. you know the musical Hamilton, Hamilton, where Aaron Burr just randomly yells out, I am an inimitable, I am an original. There's <laughs> nothing to do with what he's singing about. He just bursts out, you know, basically I am my own special creation in, randomly in the middle of the, of the song. Well, I mean, um, Dylan Alcott, who's such an admirable fellow, when he became Australian of the Year a few months back, that was his message. Be yourself. There's nothing simpler. There's nothing more important. And and, and I want to say, well, yeah, but... You, but it's bad to... advice if you're Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> if you're Harvey Weinstein, you do not need to be true to yourself. You don't need to be... I mean, you, you, you need a personal makeover. You need a teacher. You need someone to lead you through your errors to get some perspective, to get some humility. Um, some people, people don't need to be true to themselves. Some of the people need a new self. Yeah. And, and fortunately, Christian faith, properly undertaken, if you want to put it that way, has this mechanism for self-examination. It's called confession. So part, part of a good church service will involve people looking inward, but not celebrating what they find. But, but actually uh, regretting sometimes and repenting of what we find. So Jesus talks about not following your heart, but what comes out of the heart is all sorts of awful things. But it, it's not just a negative message. I, I think this is the lovely thing about the Bible's teaching on identity. It, it is freeing. One more example. So, for example, one of the key tenets of the movement is you belong to yourself. Yeah. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, um, um, uh, how does he put it? You are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. It sounds like the most countercultural thing you could say in our day. And you ask yourself, oh, my goodness, uh, isn't belonging to someone else the definition of oppression? There are a few contexts in which belonging to someone else is a good thing. For example, in a loving relationship, you know, you belong to Naomi and Naomi belongs to you. That, that's actually a beautiful thing. The Song of Songs is, is the first thing I could find in the ancient world to say this, where it says, I am my beloved's and he is mine. And if you read on in 1 Corinthians, you are not your own because you were bought with a price. You were loved with an everlasting and costly love. So there's a sense in which belonging to yourself is not the greatest human experience. Belonging to another in that kind of loving relationship is what really brings freedom so, I mean, this is going to sound paradoxic, but would you say there is more freedom as there is being a slave of Christ than being the tyrant of my own identity? Totally. Yes. This is, I mean, the world drips with irony in our day, and that's one of the ironies. It, it is actually more freeing to be part of God's family, to be living the life story of Jesus Christ, putting ourselves to death carrying our own cross now all of this is is not done perfectly by christians in the christian community Let, let's be honest but there are the resources there within the christian faith to live a life which brings a better identity and a, and a, and a better way to find yourself excellent i mean jesus put it beautifully didn't he yeah, in all four gospels you've got this saying as you'll know mike the uh, um that the one who seeks to find themselves will lose themselves but there's different variations of it. Yep. 
But Jesus has got this paradox of identity himself, right? Right at the heart of his teaching. Good. Well, as, as a as a poor scholar, Brian, I'm very impressed you know something about the Gospels. <laughs> I know. As I've always said you are not a one-trick pony. You know stuff besides <laughs> the Apostle Paul. It's good to good to see that demonstrated. Well, I think that's a that's a, a great note to end on with the words of Jesus. The book is How to Find Yourself, published by the great people at Crossway. Um, you can probably buy this book like places like Kurong, Amazon, anywhere else. But um, I've 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 had several copies which I've given away to people, and I say, and this is no sense of exaggeration, and not because Brian's my boss. Everyone I've given this book to so far has been impressed with it and gone like wow uh either learning about you know what is our cultural moment or what does the bible have to say about personal identity in an age of fragmented identity in an age of be true to yourself only you know who you are Th this is a this has been a terrific book to read and um, naomi has just started my wife naomi has just started reading it too and she's enjoying it as well so congratulations on the book brian i hope it does uh well uh, i should say if you like carl truman's book um but you want something that's kind of similar but a little bit more uh not not dumbed down but a little bit more simpler to explain some of the sim things and how they work out in pastoral practice. I think people who like Carl Truman's book, Brian, will definitely like your book as well. Well, look, I'm happy to say that I'm dumber than Carl Truman. Um, but the, I, I think I, I, so the hope, I mean, Carl wrote the forward very kindly for my yeah. book. Carl's work is really about the roots of expressive individualism. My, my way of saying it is to continue the metaphor. It, my book's about the fruit of expressive individualism and where else to plant yourself. Well, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Well, Brian, always a pleasure to talk to you, um, whether here or um, in class or anywhere. So, yeah, everyone, you know what the book is called. Uh, don't miss out. Uh, copies are limited, uh, limited to as many as Crossway can sell. Uh, but don't, but don't miss out. Brian, great talking to you. Thanks, thanks for thanks for chatting with me here. Good on you. Thanks, Mark.